Kidney Warriors. It is July 7th, 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And you know what that means? That means Dad Vice TV Live. Hey, everyone. Hey, Cheryl from Malaysia. Wow. Boy, it's probably really late there if, I, if I've i got my time zones right. We've got people from Paris. we got Germany. we got all over the United States. So glad to have you all here. I am James with Dad Vice TV, your online kidney health coach. And this is Dad Vice TV Live, which means we also have. Oh, she's just taking a sip, so I'm gonna. <laughs> <laughs> I'm aware she comes. We also have Jen with us, who is a renal dietitian. Now, for those of you that are new, let me just do, just do a really quick introduction of myself. I was a regular guy, not caring about my diet, eating the standard American diet, which meant not very healthy. And all of a sudden, I was diagnosed with stage five kidney failure. And I was told there was no chance, actually not no chance, that there was zero chance, because I asked for a percentage. How, what are the chances of me getting better? They said zero chance of getting better. But my nephrologist was wrong. I worked with other doctors. I worked with renal dietitians like Jen, and I changed my diet. Things that were hurting my kidneys, boo, I stopped doing those things, and I started getting better. I got to stage four. Then I was battling with anemia pretty bad. Kept working on my diet, kept getting healthier and healthier. Kicked anemia to the curb. Now I am stage three and most importantly, I don't suffer a single symptom. If you met me on the street, you'd be like, who is that crazy high energy guy? He definitely does not have any kidney problems. Now, let me introduce, let Jen introduce herself and tell you what a renal dietitian is in case you're here for the first time. So thanks, James. Always happy to be back on here with you weekly. Uh, so my name is Jen. I am a renal registered dietitian, meaning I am a registered dietitian, went through my internship, my undergrad, uh, did a lot of free work, but also worked with a lot of people in a lot of different areas to take an exam, become a dietitian. And then I worked with more people all in the kidney world, particularly dialysis. I've worked in several dialysis clinics, and I uh, basically learned from there that people were not getting the support that they need when it comes to nutrition and their kidney issues. That inspired me to start my own private practice, which I do now, and I work virtually with clients all over the U.S. for one-on-one -on -one work, but I also have a group program that is available internationally for people to join as well, which we're actually in the process of right this moment. So that is what I do, and it is my passion to help people with kidney issues learn how to make the most of the right nutrition and really get rid of a lot of the myths and old school thoughts that we think of when it comes to a renal diet, because a lot of them are outdated, not true, and sometimes downright harmful. Mm -hmm. So I love helping people about that. And I'm really excited because that's what we're going to be doing today. Oh yeah. Today we are going to talk about probably one of the most misunderstood parts of being diagnosed with chronic kidney disease. So as soon as you get diagnosed, and I went right through this, your doctor's going to tell you, you need to cut back on certain things. Potassium, which is our topic today, is one of the things they're going to tell you to cut back on. They're also going to talk about phosphorus, maybe even protein, tell you to drink a little bit more water. But that's not really telling you too much. Cut back on potassium. What's that mean? So what do we normally do? We go on to Google. It could be a friend or it can be a foe. And we start seeing all these articles about high potassium foods. And we start cutting. Cut, 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 cut. A banana? It can kill you practically. That's what we think. So we don't eat bananas. Avocados? Oh, no avocados. Can't have those. If it's got potassium, we're avoiding it. Turns out, mm -mm 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 -mm, that's not the right thing to do. Our doctors, they kind of didn't communicate too well. That's the way I like to think about it. Yes, we need to watch our potassium. And if our potassium gets out of control, we need to cut it back. But we don't need to go to zero potassium. We don't need to go to zero sodium, mm -hmm. zero phosphorus, zero anything, except probably like sodas. You can do zero sodas. We can do some water. But we cut far too much because we don't understand it. Then all of a sudden, we could be in trouble. Now, when I was diagnosed, I got diagnosed 
because of heart problems. My heart is not doing well. My blood pressure, whew, I did not know that machine could go that high. My blood pressure was crazy. And when I first got to the hospital, I was so low on potassium. It was dangerously low. And they hooked up bags of potassium, started pumping it in me. And let me tell you guys, you don't want to be low on potassium. It hurts when they give it to you. It actually burns as it's moving up your arm through your chest. At many points, I just felt like, oh, I want to pull that IV out of my arm. It hurts. But I needed the potassium because too little is dangerous. Your muscles need it. Your heart needs it. Your body needs potassium. So Jen's going to help us understand how do we find the right balance of potassium. And we're going to discover potassium is good for you. What's bad is too much potassium. And that's how a lot of these nutrients are. There's a Goldilocks zone. You got to have a certain amount. Can't have too much, but you get to eat practically whatever you want as long as you fall within that range of all the different nutrients that you got to watch. You know, you need some sodium so you can enjoy a little bit. Can't enjoy a whole bunch like you used to do and buy a whole bunch of processed food. But anyway, let's stay on topic. Now, there's a lot of um, questions already in the live chat. Keep the questions coming. And if they fit into the conversation while Jen and I are talking about potassium, I'll inject those in. And at the very end, I will go back and answer questions. And I saw there were some questions that came up. Um, Abby, we will definitely get to your question. It's a follow-up to a question that um, I responded to yesterday on Jen's Facebook page. And if you guys do not belong to Jen's Facebook page, there will be a link to her. There is a link in the description of this video. Go down there, click it, follow her. Join her group. There's all sorts of great free information, including my favorite thing. And I wish there was more of these. You know what I'm going to say? Cooking videos. <laughs> I still got to learn how to cook. I, I keep watching these different cooking videos. And holy cow, I'm like, I'm just sitting here making stir fry. I, I'm, I, I was thrilled with stir fry. But now I'm like, I need some more variety besides just changing up the <laughs> sauce. All right, Jen. So I just rambled on a whole bunch. You guys know I have the talking gene, and I got it from my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Her and I in a room, no one gets a word in. Um, let's talk about potassium. Um, so I kind of mentioned how, as a kidney patient, the first thing I did was over restrict. I just started cutting mm -hmm. it everywhere. I had no clue what to do in the beginning because I had not worked with a renal dietitian, which for those of you out there who have not worked with a renal dietitian, you got to. It is life changing. All of a sudden you're like, what? I'm cutting off too much stuff. I can have that. I can have this. I can love food again. Work with the renal dietitian. You owe it to yourself. And let me tell you, future you, they're going to be so happy the day you started working with a renal dietitian. All right, Jen. So tell us about potassium. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is a really good topic. I, I think this is something that so many people, it's, um, so I guess the image that comes to mind for me when we think potassium, I imagine somebody going to like touch a hot stove and they just like, Oh no. And they pull back right away because it's like, Oh no, this is, this is too bad. This is too dangerous. And this is the way that, um, a lot of healthcare professionals and a lot of websites treat the idea of potassium they make it sound so off limits that it becomes in a way like a, a, a mentality of like a life or death thing. And yes, in some cases, it really can be that way. It can be super, super crucial because having potassium that is too high or too low can result in cardiac arrest. This is something that because potassium helps with regulate helps with regulating muscle contractions and your heart is a muscle and it, it's like sticking a fork into an outlet. It just, the shock overrides the system. So we want to be really careful with potassium, but it's not as restrictive as we used to think it was. Um, and I mean, even now to this day, I have clients telling me, Oh, my doctor said to not have z uh, no potassium, zero potassium at all, because mm. you know, that's just it. You can't have it. And even with a higher potassium level, 
it's not possible to have zero potassium. Potassium is in everything. I mean, nuts, seeds, dairy, meat, fruit, vegetables, grains, it is in everything. So to avoid potassium entirely is not possible. And that can create a lot of stress and a lot of, a lot of anxiety for people that are told by their professional to have zero potassium because every milligram they're having, there's this guilt of, I'm not supposed to be having this, but then they're like, well, what do I have? Because they know, you know, potassium's in everything. Mm -hmm. So we need to have potassium. And I will just preface this and say, if you struggle with potassium balance, if you have a high potassium level, that is a really, really important situation that you need to be discussing with your doctor and hopefully with your dietitian about as well, because there's many factors related to your potassium management. And it's not just your diet. There's a lot of other factors that can affect or influence your potassium balance. So it doesn't necessarily just need to come from this idea of restricting in the diet. It can come from medications. It can come from supplements. It can come from, uh, GI stomach issues, it, it can be influenced by a lot of different factors. So what I like to teach people is basically, and this is probably like the overarching um, theme of this conversation or what this will, what this topic will be about, is that you shouldn't be restricting potassium if you do not have the evidence to restrict it. Potassium does a lot, a lot of great things. Like James was just saying, you know, he needed potassium. That was something that was really important for his health. And it can definitely be confusing if you have in one ear, you're getting this idea of restricting potassium. And then in the other, you're being told to have more. That doesn't make any sense. And that can be, again, super frustrating. But at the end of the day, we need potassium. It just really depends on that amount for you. And I will tell you, um, the ranges when it comes to potassium for people can vary. It can vary anywhere from as low as 2000 milligrams a day. And that can be for somebody who has severe problems, really, really hard time with balancing their potassium. Um, I oftentimes would actually see that who are on dialysis more so than anything. So 2000 is the lowest I have seen. Um, but it's upwards of being unlimited and people actually having over 5,000 milligrams a day because that is best for their body and that is best for even their kidneys. So there's a huge, huge range, but you're not going to get the straight answer until you work one-on-one -on -one with somebody to give you that range. Yeah. And then I, were, I definitely want to emphasize, you know, guys out there, um, don't be limiting your potassium just because you think you need to. Your doctor mm -hmm. needs to tell you that you need to limit it. I was mm -hmm. pretty shocked uh, when I came home after a week in the ICU and I started eating and I was getting labs daily and potassium was one of the things they were watching. And I remember um, two days after I got out getting the lab results and they said, you're not getting enough potassium. You got to eat more. And of course I needed more because of my heart but I just over restricted and I just felt I was restricting it a little and they mm -hmm. didn't want me restricting it at all until it got up to where it was a problem. Right now it was actually too low and it was a problem. Was, they had me at the bottom of where I needed to be so that I could go home, but I had to keep getting potassium. So don't restrict it unless your doctor has told you. And it's gonna depend a lot on what stage you're at and a number of other things. If you've had a heart problem, you're probably going to need more of it. So just because somebody you know is the same stage as you, mm -hmm. and those stages are pretty wide, you know, yeah. there's quite a bit in there. You can't just echo what they're doing. You got to do what your doctor tells you. And I'll add really quickly to you, ask your doctor why. So just because they say limit potassium, ask them why. Because sometimes, I mean, doctors... Doctors are not tra trained on the nutrition, especially not on nutrition updates. And again, we're talking old school theories of potassium restriction. Doctors are not keeping up to date with nutrition news, with the nutrition science and studies. So I want you, whenever you're told to restrict, increase, change something in your diet, if it's coming from somebody, I want you to ask them why 
because they need to explain that to you. If they can't explain that to you, or if they're just saying, oh, it's because you have kidney disease, that's not good enough. Exactly, that's that is not, not the enough. answer. No, that, that's just like if you were to read it online, if you were to read an article and it said, oh, you have kidney disease, you need to restrict potassium. Again, that's a blanket statement. It's not the case for everybody. And if your doctor is telling you to restrict something like that, but not explaining why, get a second opinion, get, go see a dietitian, go get additional, uh, information and evidence and support because at the end of the day, you need to understand what's going on with your body too. And if you follow these guidelines blindly, it can lead you down the road that you don't want to go down. And so you really, really do want to understand what you're looking for. And we actually have a perfect example that just came through. Someone said, Hey, why did my renal dietitian without looking at any labs, just tell me that a cup of blueberries was too much potassium and I should only have half a cup. I think that's just them falling back on some standards, uh, but they really need to look at your labs, see where you're at to customize what you should have. Yeah, and I, I would also, I mean, just in, the, I, we can't go too far into this because I, you know, I have no idea about what's going on here. Mm -hmm. um, but is it your renal dietitian, like you're working one on one privately exclusively with them? Or is it a renal dietitian that you've chatted with or, or you know, is giving out information because I'll, I'll give examples personally. When people ask me questions in the Facebook group, if they ask me questions on Instagram, if they email me through the website or something, um, I can't give specific advice until I see the full picture. And I might say like, you know, try a half cup serving size instead of the cup or something like that. If, if there is a potential risk, because as dietitians, we, we want to be really cautious too, because we know a lot of these things, but until we know your full story, and that's from working one-on-one -on -one privately, until we know your full story, we'll have to be really cautious, careful, reserved with that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, that's just something that you would go back and ask that dietitian again, why, what's going on. Yep. And another quick question, um, Ray over in the UK asked, are there any side effects to having too much or too little potassium? Yes, there absolutely are side effects, whether you will feel them or not is kind of the scary thing. I've had patients in dialysis who had a potassium that was very high and had no symptoms. But then I've also had patients that had high potassium and did show symptoms. So some of the symptoms can include, okay, first we'll go into the, the too low. So a low potassium below 3.5 is considered, it's called hypokalemia, low potassium. And these symptoms can include um, irregular heartbeat or heart palpitations. It can include constipation because the body is trying to reabsorb potassium. It's trying to make sure that it doesn't get rid of potassium. You can be tired, you can be dizzy, you could get muscle cramps. Again, potassium is regulating those muscle uh, contractions. So you can get muscle cramps, you could get um, muscle pain. Uh, the most worrisome, I would say, would be the, the tachycardia or basically uh, that irregular heartbeat to potentially lead to cardiac arrest. So that's the low potassium side. The high potassium side, they're very, very similar symptoms. Um, they are still, okay, so we said that the constipation could be causing the low potassium. Now, high potassium, hyperkalemia, that could cause diarrhea of the body trying to get rid of extra potassium. But it can also lead to the same things of feeling uh, confused, dizzy, tired, again, muscle weakness. I remember having somebody in dialysis who had a high potassium, and he said uh, it was the scariest thing to him because he woke up and he couldn't get out of bed. He couldn't move his body. Ooh. He was basically um, paralyzed because of the interaction or the interference of potassium preventing him from using his muscles. And so that's really, really scary. But it can lead to um, a lot of these issues with the body's system and how we move and, and how our brains work. And again, 
low potassium and high potassium can both lead to cardiac arrest if they're not treated. So, but I have to say it's something that is not always symptomatic. So don't assume that your body will tell you right away if you have a high or low potassium. And talk with your doctor if you have concerns, you know, because and we're probably going to say this like a hundred times because it is that important that you can't, you you can't keep your doctor out of this conversation. This is the conversation to have with your doctor Mm -hmm. about any potassium concerns that you have. Yeah. And one thing that I found extremely helpful for me in my journey was constant communication. And Mm -hmm. you and I are going to do a show in August, so about a month from now, about talking to your doctor. I made certain that all of my different doctors, the endocrinologist, urologist, the nephrologist, the dietitian, my primary care physician, they all communicated together. It was a requirement I had. And if I saw one of them, like my nephrologist, I would call my primary care a few days later and just let his staff know, hey, I was at the nephrologist two days ago. Did you get information from my visit? I wanted them all to talk. And any symptoms I had or anything that seemed weird or odd or out of the usual or any concerns I had, even something I read online, I asked my doctor about it. I was completely open and honest with my doctor. And Mm -hmm. that he could then address the problems that I had concerns with and kept me on the right path. If I would have kept these things a secret, um, he wouldn't have known they were an issue. And if my doctors weren't talking to each other and I wasn't following up, making sure they were talking to each other. And that included, if I got labs from one of them, they all got the results. Plus, and we have Abby um, mentioning she's got her labs coming up in August. I always made sure and had a copy of my labs. And you guys know, I'm such a nerd. I graphed them all. I went in there, I'm like, yeah, I'm rekeying everything in so I can graph <laughs> it and see what's happening. And, yeah. oh, I ate this. What happened? Uh, but that communication is really, really important. So let's let's jump into first um, kind of where we get potassium. I and mean, we've talked about some of the things having too much, too little. Um, let's go kind of to where it all starts. What foods typically are high in potassium and which ones are typically good in potassium or lower? So everybody, I would say for the most part, assumes or or automatically connects potassium to fruits and vegetables. And just like we have already kind of highlighted, James, you talked about a few of those Mm -hmm. that are very prominently known for their potassium, which there is a huge range of potassium in fruits and vegetables. There are some that are very, very low into just like the tens, twenties, thirties of potassium. And then there's some that are very, very high that are upwards of a thousand milligrams of potassium in a serving. So huge, huge range. But the great thing about that is that it gives you a lot of flexibility to make changes and choices on the foods that you have day to day, week to week, to balance your potassium out. Um, So, you know, having something high potassium like potato or banana or avocado or tomatoes just means that maybe you want to choose some other lower potassium options like apples or pears or celery or kale. I mean, tons of of options. There's really, really a lot out there. Uh, If you are curious about the specific potassium content of um, basically figuring out what's and what and how much, I highly recommend that you use the uh, USDA food database. Just Google it because it's kind of a long, I, we can pull up the, we can pull up the link for the show notes uh, later, but pulling that up and uh, it is a great resource that dietitians, we also use that. And I'm sure some of you, the followers here, some people watching have been told by their dietitians, yes, use the USDA food database. It's a great resource that will give you the potassium content in certain servings of different types of foods, even branded foods. So certain products that you're looking for, you can find that information there. And a lot of the um, the apps we've talked about, like Chronometer, MyFitnessPal, a lot of those also use some of that information there as well. So it's a very trusted resource. Um, The USDA, uh, United States 
Department of Agriculture food database. So that's what I would recommend to look up specifics when it comes to uh, potassium. Now, moving beyond fruits and vegetables, there's also potassium, like I said, in every other food group. So we have nuts and seeds that can be quite high in potassium, but again, not something that needs to be eliminated. There's also uh, potassium in grains, so different kind of grain products. And that's one of the thoughts that used to be, uh, I guess, a, a rule that used to be followed when it came to the old renal diet of avoiding whole grains and choosing white grains because it's lower potassium as well as low phosphorus. But again, we are losing out so many benefits and the nutrients that come from whole grains that it's actually much more beneficial most times to include whole grains over white. There's also pro, or I'm sorry, there's also potassium in your protein sources. So if you're not completely plant-based, that's fine. But I don't want you to think that because you're eating more animal proteins and more animal products that you're not having potassium. There is quite a lot of potassium in animal products. So please do not think that by having more animal proteins, you're low potassium. In fact, I oftentimes would have people in dialysis who had to restrict potassium the most they would oftentimes still have high potassium because they were eating large portions of animal proteins, which is, again, another old school concept when it comes to even the dialysis diet of thinking that um, that you need to eat a ton, a ton, a ton of protein and that that's all you can have. But it's still going to affect your numbers, including potassium. So keep in mind that animal proteins will have a few hundred milligrams of potassium in them. Yeah, very important. And actually, I never even realized that. And I try to eat as much plant-based as possible. Or how should I say, I am plant-based whenever I'm not eating meat. <laughs> 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 I, I get, I still get just a little bit of chicken or some eggs in my diet because I get a, a craving for them and I'll, I'll make them up. But let me tell you, I never before ate as many fruits and vegetables as I do now. And I feel so much better. I wish I would have known this. I wish this is something they would have taught in school how to really understand nutrition and to eat to it. Um, now, so what are some good foods that are low potassium um, that maybe we should look lean more towards if we want to have maybe more of a quantity of them? Because I know you mentioned... You mentioned two that I actually like to work in, and, and we had a few people mention those in the comments, avocados. I love working avocado into my diet. And some people out there are gonna be like, what, 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 avocado in a renal diet? Yeah. No, I'm not eating a whole big old bowl of guacamole every day, but it's easy to work it in because then I just watch the rest of the potassium I get throughout the day. Um, and, and before you answer on some, some low potassium foods, one quick note for people, potassium swings pretty quickly in your body. This mm -hmm. is one of those things that if you went a little high today, you can, you know, it's not, it's not the right thing to do. Say, oh, I'll just cut it really low tomorrow, but your body does start working through potassium fairly quickly. So if you start getting too much, you can make changes today and in a few days, you could see results of your potassium starting to get back in range. So it's one of those things that um, I like that it's a quick change. It's not like uh, your creatinine levels where you're like, okay, I'm going to give up eating meat and animal protein. I'm going to go on a, 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 a vegan diet or something like that or a more plant-based diet. That, it seems to take you know a week or more to kind of see some results. But when it comes to potassium, doctors may want to do tests, you know, change your diet today and they may want to do blood tests tomorrow because it, it can have that big of a change. But what are some, some things we can lean on in, you know, choosing for our diet that are lower in potassium? Well, uh, we talked about apples. That comes up pretty oh, frequently yes. in our conversations. <laughs> 
My my favorite, my go-to food, and my kids, I can't believe it, absolutely love apples. Matter of fact, we were, I was just, just before the show started, I was like, I should get a little snack. I reached into the bag of apples, big old giant three-pound bag, and there was one apple left. And my son just looked at me with these big old eyes like, don't take my last apple, daddy. So I left <laughs> it for him. Tonight, I'll go get apples when it's over. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, apples are really, really great. It's a lower potassium option that you can have. I am also a really, really big fan of berries. The whole berry category, I think, is really great. Uh, Super high in fiber, which helps with our bowel movements, which helps with keeping our potassium in check. So making sure that we have a healthy digestive system is going to help us get rid of that extra potassium as we need to. So berries, really, really awesome. Fresh, frozen. Um... I think it's great to have a combination of, and while berries are kind of more in season right now, it's nice to have the frozen one on hands all the time Mm because they're still just as nutritious, great quality, and you don't have to be like, okay, when are they going to go bad? Do I have to use them today? Do I have to use them? It's they're there and they're good for whenever you want to use them. So berries, a hundred percent, a huge fan of, I know we talk about grapes. Grapes are super popular in the, the kidney world, frozen grapes make a really delicious summer snack. And uh, I think also like for vegetables, some of my favorite are going to be, um, I would say asparagus is Mm. higher in potassium when it's cooked, but raw asparagus is lower in potassium. And it actually makes for a pretty good salad. If you use like a vegetable peeler and you peel the stalks like you would peeling a carrot or something and make these ribbons of asparagus, it makes for a really, really good salad. Broccoli's great. I love cucumber. So mm. hydrating, refreshing during the summer. Uh, eggplant, I think, is very uh, underutilized a lot of times, but really, really great. And your variety of greens can be helpful. Now, with the, except- with the exception of the cooking greens, like cooking spinach, that's going to be a higher potassium. Uh, that's going to be a higher potassium green because think of how much it co- how much it cooks down, right? You could throw a whole container of spinach into a pan and it goes from this <laughs> giant mound. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's something to realize. All that potassium is condensed into that little tiny amount. Mm-hmm. So, if you're cooking greens, it's going to really increase that potassium load. Yeah. So one of my favorite low potassium foods or snacks is cherries, frozen cherries. I absolutely love them. And I used to suffer oh, from some terrible gout. And my doctor's like, eat some cherries, you know, snack on those when you get hungry. Now, of course, they, they got a, it's kind of some sugary, so it's not like a, a super low carb food. Um, but I would nibble on cherries and Mm -hmm. I actually had never tried cherries outside of like the chocolate covered ones with all that creamy liquid sugar in them. Yeah. (laughs) And I just love them. I get them in a a bag frozen and I can just sit there while watching a a movie and eat it, um, or throw it in something else and, and enjoy it. Um, question right here. So we know that with phosphorus. When we go with the natural sources, we don't absorb as much. Where when we go with the artificial ones, those additives, we absorb 80 to 100% of it. Is potassium similar? Do we absorb less of it if we're going with natural food that has natural potassium in it? Um, I, to be honest, I don't know too much about the absorption differences. I haven't seen a lot of research in the absorption differences of potassium. But we do know that potassium additives, similar to phosphorus additives, do influence our balance. So if you are a person struggling with your potassium balance, you may want to first, before you start eliminating foods or trying to go to that zero milligrams that your doctor is telling you, first look at your labels of the containers of food in your house. So anything that has a nutrition facts label will also have an ingredient list. I'm looking for something. I don't have any food near me. (laughs) I don't either. Yeah, I don't either. (laughs) Um, But you'll see your nutrition facts and then the ingredient list. In the ingredient list for phosphorus, you're looking for P-H-O-S, anything with phos. 
For potassium, it's not as hidden. It's a little bit more obvious. It'll be potassium X, potassium something, potassium, potassium sorbate, you know, potassium something. So look for potassium in your ingredient list to find the additives and see if you can't get an idea from what you find in your kitchen, you know, how much of those different containers that you have, what percentage of those things have potassium in them? Is it the majority of the things in your fridge, in your pantry have potassium additives, or is it a small amount? And it can kind of give you an idea of how big of an influence those things play on um, your potassium levels. Then there's the whole concept of fast food and the additives in there, which we talked about before, right? And we focus a lot on phosphorus, but the same thing goes for potassium too, that the potassium additives can be very, very prevalent in packaged foods. So that's something that we can't control as well as compared to what we can do in our own home. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I recently, just for the fun of it, decided that I had a hunkering for some KFC, some te- mm-hmm. techy fried chicken. Haven't had it in forever. And I just thought, you know, I, they got to have some grilled chicken or something like that. I'm going to go on their website and I want to look at the ingredients and they do have them. Um, it was shocking. How many ingredients are in everything? They're mashed potatoes, which I was going to eat them. It's always kind of, it's a watery consistency. I, I don't mm-hmm. know how real they are. There was this gigantic list and so many chemicals that you can't pronounce. And the gravy, <laughs> it was longer. I, I can't remember. It was probably 20 or 30 items listed in there uh, yeah. there was potassium this phosphorus that um, so it's definitely if you've got to watch for your potassium or anything else um, and you're going to go for that prepackaged food or the fast food check out the website um, I was just blown away and it quickly made my decision I'm not going to try any KFC mm-hmm. um, now there's one hidden source of potassium that I know a lot of kidney warriors end up going for by mistake because our doctors, besides telling us to watch potassium, watch phosphorus, they tell us to watch sodium. So we go and we're like, hey, we got to find us some some salt substitute because I like salt. It tastes really good. And it is just unbelievable that you know, they don't warn us. But when you turn around mm-hmm. that the back the 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 su- salt substitute container and you read it, it's a form of potassium. That's pretty much what almost all of them are. Mm-hmm. And you're just sprinkling on potassium. Right, right. So the table salt is sodium chloride, but the salt substitute is potassium chloride. So mm-hmm. it literally is. They're trading the sodium for potassium. And this is something that no matter what across the board, even for people that do not need to restrict potassium, I say, you know what, it's just way, way, way too heavy in potassium. And it's one thing, it's one thing to have an unrestricted amount, but it's another thing to like play with fire. I mean, and it's just, you you don't want to risk it. And is it really worth it? Honestly, I find very often with my clients that once they do a much more plant-based diet, they can include regular salt in their diet with no issues. So the salt substitutes, just make sure you go for something that's actually a spice blend, an herb blend, Mm -hmm. rather than a salt substitute. Yeah, And And and, always check the label. And I back that uh, using salt. So I cut salt. Uh, and my daughter's like, Hey, that, that, that little blue bottle, the lady holding the umbrella, that's all, get rid of it. That's all processed iodized salt. That's no good for you. Um, he said, you know, get rid of it. You're going to eat too much salt to start with as you get adjusted to your diet. And I was going to prepackage frozen meals, going out there, getting mm-hmm. this, getting that. And there is a ton of salt in those. Uh, but as I started learning how to do basic cooking, all of a sudden, my salt, my sodium was getting on the low side. And my doctor said, okay, now you're doing good. Now I want you to get a salt grinder. So you grind that salt, you know, you're adding it and you can start adding salt to your food to taste. And 
at first I was a little fearful. I'm like, eh, I don't know about this. But yeah, I my my labs, when I get up, my sodium's always nice, right there in the middle of the, the perfect range, that, that ideal range. I'm right there in the middle and I am using salt. Now I'm grabbing a grinder. I'm grinding it. I'm using pink Himalayan sea salt uh, and not restricting it. And then if I don't want salt, I'm reaching for spices. And I never really understood how to use spices. To me, they were in the pizza, they were in the lasagna and stuff like that when I ordered it. Mm -hmm. um, but now I'm like, hey, I can add these spices. And boom, there's a little bit of flavor. And uh, I, I love Italian food. And my Italian friends are going to hate when I say this, but I absolutely love just going crazy with garlic. <laughs> they all tell me, you use too much garlic, too much. It's little. It's all. <laughs> I just love it. I go crazy with garlic. I, I do too. I mean, I, I don't see what's wrong personally. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, there was a question I saw earlier on a website somewhere about chocolate and potassium. So chocolate, t it tends to be high in potassium, correct? Yes. So uh, like a regular chocolate bar can have 200 milligrams of potassium in it, which in the grand scheme of things, it might not sound like a lot, but if you are cutting out fruits and vegetables, if you're cutting out nutrients that can give you a lot of great help, but then you're going to add chocolate, I think we got some different priorities here and you just want to be really mindful. And the other thing with chocolate too, is that it's very high, the, the cocoa it's very, very high in phosphorus, like very high in phosphorus. So chocolate in general is just, you want to be super, super careful and don't consider that something to factor into your day-to-day -day eating habits. Mm -hmm. um, if it is something that you have every now and then, you can you can think of how it's going to balance out in there and that it may or may not be a huge influence. But if you are trying to find a way to include chocolate every single day and you think, oh, 200 milligrams, um, and that's an example, there's different kinds and, and the percentages will vary as well. Uh, luckily, the newer food labels will be requiring potassium, so it will give all kidney warriors better opportunity to check potassium on foods. Um, but right now, we still they still don't have to include it. They're still kind of updating their nutrition labels. So just keep in mind, it's it's high in potassium, high in phosphorus, something to be aware of. Again, that's not typically thought of when it comes to the uh, potassium content, but it is higher in potassium. Yeah. So um, for a typical, I, I, we're not going to have specifics and the number is going to vary from person to person, but typically do you, do you have a, like a, how much potassium on average would a fairly healthy person eat in a meal or a kidney patient? I know it's going to vary. Are you stage five, four, three? Do you have potassium problems? Do you have heart problems? All those will vary. But do we have, there's a few people that have asked, is there a basic amount? Just to give them an idea. So if they're looking at something and they're like, oh, that's 200 milligrams of potassium, should they be going like, whoa? Or should they be like, oh? Okay, so... The range can be pretty different. Um, there's a few different kind of numbers to think of. So there's the recommended dietary allowance, which is RDA. A lot of people can kind of maybe that sounds familiar to them. So this is the amount that's the average daily amount that's seen to be sufficient enough to meet nutrient nutrition or nutrient needs for about the, for about 98%, the majority of healthy individuals. Okay. So this is that blanket, like most people can benefit from having this much potassium and we're not talking about the kidney side of things. Okay. Mm -hmm. But in general, 4,700, 4,700 milligrams of potassium is what people are looking for. Now there's another number called the adequate intake. And that is the, that's the uh, amount that's assumed enough to ensure nutritional adequacy. It's, it's enough to be the baseline. And that amount for adults is at about 2,600 to 3,400 for women and men. So 2,600 for women, 3,400 for men. Again, these are 
more general guidelines yep. of what the general population is looking for. But remember when I said my uh, dialysis group, those people that were end stage kidney failure, a significant protein or sorry, a significant potassium restriction could be 2000 milligrams. It's not very far off from that adequate intake. And then if we think about the unrestricted side, we're looking at a lot of that concept of the healthy individuals of if you don't need to restrict it, don't restrict it. So looking at that 4,000 upwards might be okay. But that's a huge range. If we're looking mm -hmm. at from 2,000 to infinite, like yeah. that's a huge range. <laughs> so you need to ask your healthcare team for a range of, or for what that target should look like for you so that you can get that answer. Um, but my, my biggest takeaway really is if it's something that you don't need to worry about, if it's something that you don't need to restrict, then don't restrict it. And mm -hmm. I'll give you an example from a graduate of my group program who said after he went through the course and he learned about potassium, he went back to his nephrologist and he's like, Hey, what's going on with potassium? Like, do I need to restrict this or what's happening? And his nephrologist said, Oh yeah, no, we just tell everybody to restrict it because that's the general rule. And he's like, you, you don't need to restrict it. So this guy has had an improvement with his kidney health by understanding potassium, knowing more what that means for him. And then having that conversation with, I'm sorry, having that conversation with his nephrologist that's given him the green light and that security to know that he can eat more potassium because it's really helping him. It's good for him to include that. So if you're looking for a range, you can know that a significant, a significant restriction would be in that 2000 milligram range. If there's no such thing as a zero milligram potassium diet. There's no such thing. If you are on a zero milligram potassium diet, you are on a zero calorie diet. It is just not going to happen. So yeah, and you're not you going to be to with us much longer. <laughs> no, how can your body, how can your kidneys, even with kidney decreased kidney function, how can your kidneys sustain if you're not giving them nutrition, right? Yeah. And our kidneys aren't, they're there to remove, or one of their tasks is to remove mm -hmm. the excess. Mm -hmm. um, our body needs this stuff. We need sodium. We need potassium. We need calcium. We need a, a certain amount of protein to live, to heal, to, to keep going, to have our energy. So we never want to restrict too much. And, you know, we don't want to restrict unless our doctor told us. So a number of people have asked, you know, they've said, hey, I'm stage five. How much potassium should I be getting? Jen hit it right on the head, the nail on the head right there. Check with your doctor because there's so many factors and there is no one answer for everyone. And, and I think that's part of the, the challenge we, we as kidney patients face when we get diagnosed, we go on the internet and we see these numbers and we're like, okay, I got to go to that number. Uh, and I was one of those in the beginning. I saw the numbers, go with those numbers, go with those numbers, Facebook groups, you know, oh, don't go over 1200 milligrams of sodium a day. I'm like, oh, okay, there, there's don't go over 1200. I'll just mm -hmm. get way under it. I'll have a buffer. No, 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 that wasn't right. And when I finally sat down with a renal dietitian, it was the second visit. The first visit, her and I had a conversation. And what foods do I like? What foods do I not like? Would I eat this? She had a few suggestions. What do you think of adding this to your, your diet? I'm like, oh, no, that one? Okay, yeah. And she asked when I ate and a whole bunch of questions. So she got to know me. The next visit, which is about a week later, she had put together a lot of material based on my labs, the treatment strategy my doctors were working on, and what I like to eat and my goals. Well, you know, did I want to lose weight at the same time? Um, and she gave me, and this is the first time I heard it ever, two numbers for everything, a minimum and a maximum. She said, stay in between this number for your sodium. Stay in between these numbers for your potassium. It wasn't that she said, James, you're 2,812 milligrams of potassium. No, no. She gave me a bottom number. Get at least this. Don't go over this number. And then I just used an app and I tracked everything. And when I went to eat something, then I went to add it. And I, I use chronometer because it has these nice little graphs. And if I added something, I went red 
on mm-hmm. sodium or potassium or phosphorus or something. And those little graphs are only in the pay version. They're not in the in the free version. Um, if I saw that, oh, if I add, if I eat that, it's too much. I didn't need it. I ate something else, and I stayed in my limits. And all of a sudden, my food choices were no longer no, 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 no. Eliminate, eliminate, eliminate. They were portion control. It was mm-hmm. wow. I've got enough left over. I can have some potatoes if I want in that meal. You know, not, 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 not a gigantic baked potato, but I can have <laughs> some of those roasted little red potatoes that I love so much. You know, right. I, was, I was discovering, holy cow, I can fit the stuff in now that I know not to be afraid of the numbers and that it's not this one number that you either hit it or, or you're in big trouble. It was a range. And... And, oh, and there's someone saying, can I eat a potato? So it's going to depend on the size of potato. A potato has a certain amount of potassium and other nutrients in it. Um, you can work and most likely get it to fit in your diet without any issues. Um, I eat potatoes not very often because I'm still trying to be on the lower carb side. But boy, let me tell you, I love me some grilled or roasted red potatoes chopped <laughs> up. Or purple potatoes. Oh, those little tiny purple ones. I love those. Um, <laughs> now I'm getting hungry. All right. <laughs> Talking about food. <laughs> yeah, yes. I mean, I think you have a really good point about, you know, adding the potatoes in. It's if you if you can find that range, you talk with your healthcare team and get that range of potassium in there, then that's when you start doing the deductions. Okay, I can have 4,000 milligrams of potassium, a potato has about 900 milligrams. So I'm going to deduct that from what I have. And this is what I have left. And then I'm going to deduct my, uh, my cup of cherries. I'll deduct the spinach that I want, all of those things. And that's when you can start to, um, kind of see how it all literally adds up together and how it works for you. And James, I think that's a great point that you made of yes, have potatoes. It shouldn't be an everyday kind of thing. I mean, Mm -hmm. really, not many foods I would say should, should, or need to be an everyday kind of thing. Um, we talk about categories of foods being everyday fruits and vegetables every day, but it doesn't have to be the same fruits and vegetables every day. Yep. And, and what I do is I find out from the wife, are we doing something for dinner tonight? Um, or is dinner like on me? Is it going to be mm-hmm. one of those days where we got the kids are busy, they're going to swimming, they've got dance or something going on. I'll just go make my own dinner. Or are we doing something tonight? Maybe it's a special night and she wants to go out. So then I kind of, if we're going to go out, mm-hmm. I kind of say, okay, well, let me set aside this much of my allowances, this much food. I know what I'm going to eat at that place. And then I just have the rest and I, I use that up at lunch. So I can then go out and we don't do it as often now because of all the stay at home stuff, but I can then go out and enjoy myself because I kind of saved my, my, a lot of my allowances for each of my nutrients for dinner. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, that's kind of my approach. I don't, I don't like to plan lunch and then dinner's the leftover. I like to plan dinner early in the day. And then it helps me determine what I'm eating for lunch. Maybe I'm going to have mm-hmm. some stir fry for lunch and not so heavy on all the vegetables, you know, because, <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, the, the stuff adds up, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, that's kind of how, how I do it here. Um, I'm going to go through the questions real quick because we have a lot of comments here. Thank you, everybody. Now there are a number of, uh, questions that are asked that are very specific and those are not things that jen and i can answer those are questions you got to take to your doctor um and and talk to them talk to your your renal dietitian if you don't have one oh my god that's the best thing you can do for yourself is work with the renal dietitian and and i was actually just talking to someone the other day about it a renal dietitian so i work with them often but i'm a nut with working with people I love constantly asking questions and learning. Um, I could have just visited my renal dietitian a few times, got started, and then just probably done a phone consultation or something with her every so often. Um, I picked up 
how to do it from her really quickly. It, it became so easy once she explained things to me and got me set on the right path. Mm-hmm. Um, a renal dietitian isn't like your nephrologist or your your um, primary care physician. You really need to keep going back constantly and keeping an eye on things, especially if you're at a low GFR. Um, but I love constantly going back to mine. And she even tells me, you don't, you know, she, she might say, oh, why don't, why don't you come back in three months? Like, oh, how about 30 days? That sounds good. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's your call. Okay, I'll see you in 30 days. <laughs> and I just do it because I like it. I love ans- asking questions, getting more information, sharing things. And it's uh, with a renal dietitian, it's a conversation. Mm-hmm. I don't really have conversations with my doctors. They're, they're yeah. somewhat conversational, but they're very technical, medical with a renal dietitian, I'm like, oh, you know what? I got a hankering for X, Y, and Z, you know, and I'm, I'm having trouble figuring out, can I really make that fit? She's like, oh, let's do it. It's like a Jenga puzzle. And boom, yeah. we're working on it together. And we're, you know, we're talking about it. And she's giving me alternatives. Well, have you thought about this? What about this? Uh, so I love seeing mine often. But let me kind of go through some more of these questions here. Uh, we got a... James, you're looking well, mate. Thank you very much, Chris. <laughs> I feel fantastic. And actually, to be honest, I've noticed I my in my first videos, I should get a picture as I could always pop up here. Boy, did I look sickly. My eyes all sunken in and dark and my my energy was so low. Now my wrinkles have started to go away. My eyes are looking normal. Um, I'm just so excited. And there's no magic to it. It's just Sticking with the diet, giving my body what it needs, not too much, stopping anything that hurts my kidneys. Mm -hmm. Um, Someone asked any good snacks for kidney patients. Any suggestions you have, snacks overall? Um, I mean, I'm always a sucker for like peanut butter and apple or celery. Um, Weren't we talking about ants on a log before? And some yeah, yeah. People, yeah, they didn't know. I mean, that's always. Hey, really you got good. Anthony saying, "Hey, peanut butter." <laughs> yeah, there you go. See, it's definitely something that can fit. It just depends on you. You have to find out if it fits your kidney diet. That's the question. Yep, so, I um, I do love cucumber and I do mm-hmm. love apples and and I did not understand there is a huge difference between apples, whether they're Pink Lady, they're Fuji, mm-hmm. they're Gala. The bigger ones are even different yeah. than the smaller ones. It's it's amazing how much variety there is, flavor, crispness, juiciness. I absolutely love apples. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another, I think, savory snack, because I know that was the specific question, would be uh, popcorn. I think oh, popcorn yeah. is a really, really great snack. It's whole grain. We've talked about adding nutritional yeast which is a great flavoring to add to the popcorn. Yeah. Yes. And that is my new fake cheese. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I use it quite yeah, it's often. it's a really good go-to. Salads. Uh, and I bought a, I didn't buy the giant bag. I bought a pretty big bag. It lasts mm-hmm. so well because you don't have to use oh, yeah. that much. I'm, I, I can't believe I went so long without that. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. I think it's such a great add-in and, once you start looking into a lot of plant-based recipes, a lot of them do call for nutritional yeast to give it that umami, uh, cheesy kind of flavor. So it's really, really good. Yep. Oh, now someone said, is, or asked the question, is there less potassium in general in a plant-based diet? So that's going to be high in fruits and veggies. So I'm going to... I mean... I'm going to think it it's probably a little you higher. And you just, yeah. If you did a plant-based diet and I mean, obviously if you picked, if you, if you focus on lower potassium in a plant-based diet, that's a pretty restrictive diet. Um, but, uh, what we're finding, and when I say we, I mean like renal dietitians, uh, what we're finding though is with a more plant-based or plant-focused diet, there can be better control of the potassium because a person has more probiotics in their diet, more prebiotics in their diet, better bowel movements so that more potassium is coming out as compared to a diet 
the more typical American diet. If you guys have ever heard the SAD, which yes. stands for standard American diet. That's why I always uh, say I used to eat the standard American diet. Yeah. So people know SAD. Yeah, exactly. It's not good. And that is traditionally only a few servings of fruits and vegetables, which is actually typically low, which is the reason why they're requiring potassium to be put on nutrition facts. Because in general, Americans do not get enough potassium. So back to the original question, plant-based versus a standard diet, uh, it, it really depends on the foods that you choose. But you can have a plant-based diet with 4,000 milligrams of potassium. You can have a, a – I mean, I don't, like the, I don't like the word real food because plant-based is still real food. It's as real but as like, it gets. Yeah, but I mean <laughs> – so like the animal animal based diet um, that you can do a four thousand milligram potassium diet there as well. It, it you can do it no matter what. It really depends on your preferences and your needs. Yeah, and then we have a few other questions. Oh, real quick, a few people had asked, and I forgot to bring this up about blood pressure medicine and yes. potassium. Can you comment a little bit about that? Yes, this is one of the huge reasons why you want to have the conversation with your doctor about potassium because medications, especially the ones related to blood pressure, can influence your potassium level, whether it brings it up or brings it down. So when you want to know more about your potassium and if your doctor is saying cut back on potassium, you can respond back and say, well, is my medication affecting my potassium level? Or is there something we can do about that first and see if that would be another option? Because the medication does have an important role with your potassium. We can't go too deep into that here, um, but that is definitely a question. I do talk a little bit more about like some specific kinds in the, the group course and we go into more about what, what happens with those and what to talk with your doctor about. But the bottom line is still talk with your doctor, the prescribing doctor of those medications. Yep. And then we had someone ask, how can I control dizziness and CKD? Um, that is definitely something you got to talk to your doctor about. It could be your mm -hmm. blood pressure. I, when my blood pressure gets too low, like especially in the beginning when the doctors were messing with the different pills that I take, what time, what dosage, I would get dizzy just standing up. I could be sitting down, stand up, and I would get so dizzy. And it was my blood pressure was just a little too low and they had to tweak it and get it right. So if you're having dizziness, you know, and you believe it's because you're CKD, or if you have dizziness whatsoever, it doesn't matter what you think it is, um, talk to your doctor about that. They can look at what medications you're taking. They can look at your blood pressure and mm -hmm. work with you on that. There's no like food for dizziness or anything like that. Uh, let's see what else we have in here. Let me scroll all the way to the beginning because there was a question. Got so many hellos from all around the world. Oh, I love that. Hello, everybody out there. Oh, Chris in Los Angeles. Ah, I miss SoCal. He used to live there for 10 years. Um, Abby, I told you I would answer your question, Abby. So let me kind of um, address it. She asked, how did I stop leaking protein from my kidneys? And this is a question about mine. So I got very lucky. So my doctor explained it this way. And I may say this word wrong, so you can help me, Jen. There's that metal thing. I think it's called a colander or colon for rinsing mm -hmm. stuff. The colander. Yeah. <laughs> colander, yeah. Uh, think, he told me, think of your kidneys as a colander, okay? And you're going to throw blueberries in there and you're going to rinse them off. Um, if you damage it and those holes get broken, you break a whole bunch of holes and they're bigger, blueberries are going to fall out. And there really isn't a way to fix that. But um, another way to leak protein or another cause of protein leakage could be inflammation. If I took that colander and I could just make it bigger, the holes got bigger and blueberries started falling out. And that's why if you're leaking protein, the solution is not eat more protein. If you're, if you're cleaning your blueberries and they're falling out through the holes, you just don't keep putting more blueberries in there. Uh, you gotta see what you can do to fix the problem. So I ate a kidney-friendly, low-inflammation diet. So the foods that I picked were all ones that 
typically are considered anti-inflammatory or they don't cause inflammation. And the only exception I had, so I got my, my protein leakage down, way, way down, I think to around 120 or something like that, uh, which was a, a huge drop from where it used to be. And it just wouldn't get lower. And the doctor's like, well, there's one more thing we can try that may be as good as you're going to get because maybe you physically have those damaged holes, you know, the damage to your kidney, and the blueberry is going to fall out. So he said, we're going to try one more thing. So he looked at what I was eating. He said, some people, it's very rare, some people have an allergy to soy. And he said, I want you to drop all the soy stuff. And I was eating a lot of soy food, soy-based food. And I love edamame. That was my go-to snack. It was hard to get rid of salting it because I love salting edamame in the past. But I dropped edamame. I dropped all soy. My protein leakage went to zero. Zero. Not 20, which 20 is good. 20 is considered normal. 20 to zero. That little range is normal. I went to zero protein. No blueberries falling out. And it turns out I have a, an allergy to soy. So I and then we tested it by I ate some soy. I put soy back in my diet, did labs again, protein leakage, took the soy out, ate it for a bit, labs, no protein leakage. I've got an allergy to soy. It causes some mm. inflammation. Doesn't cause any problem that I could detect. No itchy skin, no itchy throat, nothing. I seem perfectly normal eating soy, except I was leaking protein because it would cause inflammation in my kidneys and that that was also a good sign that while i do have a lot of physical damage that can never ever be repaired my kidneys were also inflamed and by going on a low inflammation diet i was able to address that which also did more than just stop my protein leakage it allows my kidneys to work better with what ability they have so that also Lowered my creatinine somewhat, which boosts your GFR. It helped in a number of different ways. So hopefully that answered your the question you had, Abby. Um, that's pretty much how how I did it. I worked very closely. My primary care physician, and we will Jen and I are going to talk about this when we talk about how to talk to your doctor. He was who I picked to be my lead on my healthcare team, and he he. If any of you ever visited him, the first questions he's going to ask you is, how is stress? How are you doing with stress in life? What are you eating? I want to know what you're eating. He's all about nutrition and then exercise. <laughs> how much exercise are you getting? What kind of exercise? He looks at the body as a whole and he really addresses stress, nutrition, and exercise first before jumping on a pill that you you might you know need to take. Um, and I got very lucky and he, you know, worked with me, worked with my diet, worked with a dietitian to help me get that under control. So let me see what other questions are in here. Da, 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 da. Lots of questions. I think many of these we've, we've talked about bananas and avocados. You guys can make them fit. You just can't be eating, you know, a whole giant thing of bananas every single day. Uh, can make a great snack. I love frozen bananas. Chop them up and freeze them. Because mm -hmm. um, then it's harder to eat, so they last longer. My daughter mm -hmm. and I will snack on those while we're watching Little House on the Prairie. Yeah, We're in season eight. I think we're at episode 12. So there's only like 22 episodes in each season. We have a, a season and a half left, and we'll be done watching Aww. all the Little Houses. Uh, oh, she just loves it and brings back so many memories for me. I'm trying to talk about stuff while I scroll through these <laughs> questions to see if there's any questions we didn't touch on or that we can answer. Again, any questions that are, you know, specific like, hey, my potassium is this, my stage is that, how much blank can I have? Those ones we can't answer. Those are all for your doctor. Um, and do you want to tell them about your Facebook group while I'm looking through here some more? Sure. Yeah. So I do have a completely free Facebook group that I offer to people just like you who are having kidney issues. And uh, this is a really, really wonderful community of people that really are interested in learning on doing a more plant-based diet for kidney health. So if you want to join this group and be with a lot of like-minded people who are in similar stages and are talking 
uh, I mean, sharing pictures of their food. It's so inspirational. It, it's really, really growing into an amazing group. Uh, it's, it's really wonderful again, and please be sure to answer the questions when you, uh, ask to join because I'm super protective of everybody in there and I don't just let any random people come in. Um, I want to make sure that people applying to come in are really, really intended on taking care of themselves or a family member if they're interested in that. So be sure to answer the questions when you ask to join. And, uh, I do a weekly video live very often it is a cooking demo. So I'll talk, talk about techniques. I'll do a quick recipe. I will talk with you about why I'm making the food that I'm making, what I'm choosing or some substitutions, alternatives, uh, things like that. So, um, I have a lot of fun doing it. I really, really enjoy it. I love going on live and chatting with people and answering questions. And, um, same thing applies in there as it does here on these videos that I can't answer specific um, medical health lab questions, but we do talk about a lot of basically kind of getting rid of these old misconceptions of eliminating so many foods in the diet. And I show you how you can add these things into the diet and still be a okay. Awesome. Make sure you guys do join that. And I just realized we are over time. Um, there's a few questions about labs on August 4th, same time, 6 PM Eastern time. Um, Jen and I are going to be talking about labs. So at, during that uh, conversation, we'll talk about how often maybe you should get them. And like I said, there is no standard for how, how often you should get them. It's going to depend on where are you at. You know, if your stage, mm -hmm. if, if your GFR is 87, you're not going to be getting your labs that often. Uh, but if you're making changes, you're working with your doctor, you want to see what the results are you may be getting your labs even more often. The most often I got mine outside of the hospital was once a day. Um, and that was only for a week, got them every day. Then it went to every few days of every other week. Mine slowly stretched out. Um, my last labs I got because of coronavirus has now been seven months. Wait, is that right? January. Yeah. Beginning of January is my last labs that I got. Uh, That's gotta be hard. Yeah. Well, the good news is I feel great. I have no symptoms yeah. and I know what to do. So I'm sticking with it. And I did put on some weight and I don't want to go stand on that scale. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to get no, out there, exercise like friends right now, lose some more weight before I get back on that scale. I gained way too much weight. I don't know where it all came from. I'm, oh, carbs. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. We're going to have to wrap this up here because it is noon. Is it noon for you? No, it's, it's a little after one in Hawaii for Jen. Yeah, and, it's after one. Yeah, and it's her middle of her work day. She takes the time to do these for us. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for being here, Jen. Thank you, everybody out there for joining us today, putting in questions. Um, please, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe to the channel. That way you get a notification every time we do a new video. And Jen and I are here every Tuesday. We've got our schedule on the homepage of dadvicetv.com so you can see the shows that are coming up. If you miss a live one, you can always catch it on a replay. And then you can always skip through if I get a little long-winded on the replays. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much. And we will see you in the next video.